Welcome everyone to the sixth chapter and the final chapter of the webinar series of the International Network of Science, Religion and Health. I am Rafael Casarin, social scientist based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I'm the coordinator of the network and together with Mark Vieira, a network director, we organize the seminar series. This network is funded by the International Network for the Study of Science and Belief in Society. Our aim is to connect academics and practitioners, promote knowledge exchange, and provide training for researchers working on social and cultural narratives on science, religion, and health. Today, we are very excited to have two presenters based in Australia, introduced by a dear network member, Dr. Anna Halapov, Associate Professor at Deakin University. Together, they will present spirituality, science, and well-being in Australia and Brazil. Now, I will leave the introductions uh, with you, Dr. Halapov, and I hope everyone watching enjoy. Thank you very much, Raphael. And thank you again to you and Ma for including us and uh, the research from Australia uh, in the webinar series, the exciting uh, Religion, Science and Health Network uh, series. So as is customary in Australia, I would just like to begin by acknowledging the Jajawarong and Tangarong peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the land waterways and skies where I'm working from today. I recognize their living cultures and ongoing connection to country and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge Josh as an indigenous knowledge holder and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons present in this webinar listening this morning or listening online. So we're very excited to be sharing research with you all uh, on spirituality, science and well-being in Australia and Brazil. And we have two wonderful speakers. Uh, the three of us are all working together on a very exciting Australian Research Council project on Australian spirituality. So some of this research is coming out of this new project, but we're also drawing on uh, Christina, particularly in her presentation, other Australian Research Council projects that she has worked on previously and that we've also worked on together related to science, religion and health. So without further ado, I'm going to first introduce Josh, uh, who will speak for around 20 minutes and then Christina, who will also speak for around that time. And then we'll open the floor to some questions and discussion. So Joshua Waters is a First Nations Gamalaroi man, a PhD candidate and senior research fellow with the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Deakin University, and also working with us as a PhD candidate on the Australian Spirituality Project, supervised by Indigenous scholars and CI on the project Tyson Young Kapoor, and also Yin Parodies and uh, myself. Josh's work explores the critical role of Indigenous knowledges in higher education contexts. More specifically, Josh's current PhD research examines the notion of First Nations spiritualities within institutional settings and across mainstream ethics application processes in Australian universities. He's a core member of Deakin's Indigenous Knowledge Systems Lab and director of the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Collective, where he supports a number of regional, national and international partnerships and research projects aimed at utilizing indigenous knowledges for global systems change. So Josh, please, um, we, we look forward very much to hearing about your research now. Thanks so much, Anna, really appreciate that. And it's always humbling having your bio read back to you and you're sort of like, oh, I do all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and still acknowledge that, you know, I'm an early career researcher and I've still got lots to learn myself and I'm so grateful to be surrounded by um, so many amazing academics and scholars. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, share my screen, but I just wanted to, while I do that as well, just wanted to extend um, my heartfelt thanks to 
um, the network for having us and, and for so uh, Raphael and Mar um, for um, being excellent hosts. Yeah. So I think I'd, I double click then, um, which probably brought up the screen. Can't see yeah. anything yet. Here we go. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, oh, alrighty. So I <clears throat> will be presenting today on um, First Nations spirituality. So the official title of the presentation will be an exploration into First Nations spiritualities in yeah. Australia. Um, and as mentioned, um, I'll be presenting um, on my own with that one, and mm -hmm. just as a as a means of uh, formally yeah. commencing the presentation, I'll say Yamang in Dai Gaba, Galigal Gagar Nia, Giri Luto Rolda Nangini Nale Dawandi, Nini Wenangalawang Nadi Dai Yana Nia Gomlong and uh, in my language, which is the Gamilaroi language, uh, which comes from Central East uh, Australia, or um, in an Australian context, I would usually say Northwest New South Wales. But um, yeah, Gamilaroi people have been shown to uh, have occupied that area and be present on those landscapes for around about 30, 28,000 to 32,000 years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we go along. Um, but I'm coming to you from the lands of the Jarawa, Gaibal, and Western Waka Waka people. Uh, here in southeast Queensland, so anyone who knows where Brisbane is, um, a little bit west of Brisbane up on the Great Dividing Range. Um, and just an overview of the uh, presentation yeah. today, so I'll start off with an introduction and then we'll talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, cosmologies and then delve into law and governance from an Indigenous perspective and how country informs identity uh, in First Nations oh, spiritualities wow. and then a little bit of an outline on uh, the science of country uh, and some yeah. um, ceremonial and ritualistic okay. sort of uh, components bring, um, that have been verified from a scientific perspective. But um, you'll see, I'll say later, um, that obviously we don't need to have things scientifically verified for them to be valid in First Nations uh, spiritualities or any spiritualities, but um, it is a point of consideration uh, and reflection um, that I think uh, is is worth uh, examining both yeah. critically and constructively, and then I'll finish off with a conclusion. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll preface as well by saying that a lot of this information comes out of a literature review yeah. that we're uh, currently conducting in the space of First Nations spiritualities. Um, so, I'll, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll I'll keep going with that. But uh, it's been great to. Um, prepare for this presentation because it, it yeah. helped me go a little bit further with um, the scientific yeah. elements of uh, that exist in the literature um, that are relevant to First Nations spiritualities. Um, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, are the two yeah. main cultural groups that are considered yeah. indigenous to Australia. Uh, uh, archaeological excavations in the northern parts of the continent suggest that humans have occupied the landscape for more than 65,000 years. Yeah. Uh, this figure is based on the analysis of more than 10,000 cultural artifacts recovered from deposit sites in Arnhem Land, which is in Australia's northeast, uh, sorry, central north, um, but the northern parts of Australia. However, the oldest human fossil to date confirmed to be of Aboriginal origins has been estimated yeah. to be around 42,000 years, and that's uh, the discovery of Mungo Man, which is in uh, southern New South Wales and northern Victoria on Australia's uh, southeast. Um, over the past 40,000 years, Indigenous Australians have organised themselves into distinct bioregional family, kinship and clan groups. Uh, there are, and I'll show you a picture of that later. Um, it's a beautiful map of all the Australian Indigenous languages that have been recorded. Um, there are between 250 to 400 diverse languages spoken, with almost twice as many dialects, and each group has developed, refined yeah. and maintained their own systems of um, spirituality, so uh, abstraction, custom, ritual, and cultural practices which convey overarching belief in transcendent mm -hmm. forces. These groups today are collectively yeah. acknowledged as Australia's First Nations due to their respective abilities to govern and regulate themselves through yeah. the strict it's adherence to social, that. political, so. ecological and spiritual that. laws that have, uh, which have been determined by such forces. <clears throat> At the core of these belief systems we may find similarities in how humans across the globe despite sociocultural and linguistic differences have conceptualized the creation and nature of all things. 
the perspectives inherent within, <clears throat> excuse me, Australia's First Nations subsequently shape the ways that they connect, relate, and interact with the environment at all times. This can include, but is not relevant, uh, is not limited to decision making, ethics, laws, yeah. protocols, governance, uh, and governance for engaging yeah. with the landscape, but everything beyond it. As such, these same principles extend to everything above the land, such as the sky and celestial bodies, as well as everything yeah. beneath it, such as minerals and underground water systems. Uh, it is generally understood that collective interpretations of divine entities and synergies, such as gods yeah. or similar entities, are subjectively defined, but at the same time, they are processed through intersubjective dialogical positioning, which favors favors group-based autonomy relative to governance, laws and responsibilities, and accountabilities to kin, clan, and country. Um, what is pertinent in all of this are the deep connections to the land through intergenerational observance, recognition, maintenance, and transfer of First Nations spiritualities. This can sometimes be a difficult concept to grasp, um, given that spirituality is typically never really separated from everyday living. So in order to verbalize or to put into a text um, of some kind, it can be a little bit hard to disentangle what spirituality means personally and socially, uh, spiritually and culturally to indigenous people. And I would say that that's probably similar to a lot of people. Um, and But uh, spirituality can be found in everything that indigenous people yeah, do yeah, and everything yeah. that they are. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in terms of cosmologies, uh, many human cultures around yeah. the globe have uh, been structured around a notion of creation. Uh, First Nations Australian spiritualities are grounded in foundational concept, yeah. commonly referred to as the dreaming, which I'm sure some people are familiar with. The notion of dreaming or dream time emerged from the work of uh, two key figures uh, in anthropology and ethnography, mm -hmm. and that was Baldwin Spencer and F.J. Gillen, uh, and that was in the late 19th century. <clears throat> Um, these non-Indigenous authors translated a series of Arantha language terms from Central Australia, such as Altira, uh, Ngambakala, and Altira Rama, which according to them means dreaming and to dream, uh, respect respectively. Their initial interpretations suggested yeah. that the world Al Altira or Altiringa uh, reflects a deep time relationship with a distant past when the ancestors of each totemic group uh, wandered across the land, shaping the formless country through their movements as they went. Further, it reveals associations with the very old, uh, mysterious and mystical times that belong to dreams, which have always existed and where the powerful creator ancestors came into being and lived, moved, fought and died, leaving behind spiritual signatures and laws which serve as the basis of indigenous histories, narratives and cosmologies today. When First Nations peoples remember this time, it is said to elicit a dreamy or dreamlike state, hence the name. The English word uh, dreaming, however, is perhaps a little bit meagre in capturing the complexity of Altira and other words from indigenous communities. And I've listed a few there um, just to show you the diverse um, interpretations of them. So Jukupa, uh, which is in the Great Victoria Desert, um, which is sort of in Australia's central desert region, um, Pintupi, Pintupi. Uh, which is in Western Desert as well, and then Eastern Kimberley up in North Australia's Northwest yep. uh, will have a different name, Wonga. Um, and these all essentially describe this a very similar concept. Uh, in Gamilaroi, like I said, on Australia's Central East Coast, uh, which is, you know, hundreds of kilometres um, from a lot of those groups, we would say Burukur, but we essentially are talking about very similar ideas and philosophies and concepts. Um, in any case, the dreaming is an important part of First Nations Australian cosmologies, which explain, uh, quote, the origin of the universe, the workings of nature, the nature of humanity, and the cycle of life and death. <clears throat> Further, the dreaming encompasses a time when the laws for existence were laid down by creator ancestors, or those divine um, energies and synergies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's important to note that the dreaming is both bound and unbound by a sense of time and timelessness. Uh, Wick First Nations uh, Aboriginal scholar Tyson Yonker Porter, um, who we talked about earlier, describes this atemporality as a super rational interdimensional ontology endogenous to custodial ritual complexes, um, while others, such as white anthropologist um, Bill Stanner, WH, WEH Stanner, referred to it as an everywhere, um, suggesting that 
Uh, it's an omnipresence of sacral energies which pervade the universe and all of creation basically all the time. Yeah. On the other hand, indigenous concepts of time have also been described as a co-becoming where individual constituents' agency, such as species or humans, um, is recognized as relative to all other things in existence. Yeah. In addition to the in intangential elements encompassed in notions of the dreaming, these interpretations yeah. can include correspondent empirical ob observations or what uh, Deborah Bird Rose in 2010 called uh, synergistic entanglements, I like that term, um, that store valuable information about yeah. the land and things that live in it, live with it, and how they live with it. Sorry, I can't see the word there. <laughs> um, such observable properties of country can include how seasonal variations in wind speed and direction can activate changes in, uh, for example, insect behavior, which supports their migration from one place to the next. So say, for example, at this time of year, um, the wind might be blowing um, pretty fiercely in a northwesterly direction. Um, and what that does is yeah. there's certain um, uh, insect larvae which will come up out of the ground and then they'll metamorphose into moths and the moths will fly in that southeast southwesterly direction um, and that'll get them to the next place where they'll have another stage of their lives. Um, and those things are kind of bound in an interpretation of law that that um, southwesterly wind will always come up at that time and those insects that'll trigger their behavior and the movement of the insects yeah. to another place and then you know that trigger those that'll trigger other changes in those places where they move to yeah. um, and furthermore certain flowers along the coastline can signify behavioral adaptations in sea mammals so an example of that is how a certain flower uh, which is the spear lily um, will will come into season and people will look at that yeah. uh, flower and and they'll know that the whales are migrating um, back to their equatorial zones from down south. Um, so there's there's uh, indicators there is what we call them. Um, the appearance of certain birds flying low in equatorial zones can indicate the start of monsoon season for yeah. people um, in those tropical areas. The notion of the dreaming relative to interpretations of space and time ascribes deeper meaning to country than just a location as the creator, creator ancestors still reside in the land, water and sky through both abstract and concrete representations yeah. and therefore all things are imbued with sacred essence which is revived, revived and relived through story, song, art and ceremonial yeah. cycles performed by First Nations peoples. Um, so that's a map of the Aboriginal languages that I spoke about um, earlier. So each one of those different colours represents yeah. a different language that is spoken in that area. Um, typically, if you see a map of Australia today, it's just got the seven sort of states and territories, which kind of really um, yeah. reduces the complexity of Indigenous yeah. languages. And same with the terms Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. They kind of um, homogenize what is largely a diverse group of people, as you can see there. Um, so we tend to say First Nations and we respectively um, emphasize the yeah. value of um, those people's abilities to govern themselves, to formulate their own spiritual contexts and laws and their own politics uh, and their own cuisine yeah. is something that I usually say as well. Um, so uh, another comparison that I typically make when I show people this is uh, if you look at a map of Europe, um, which many people here will be from, um, you look at a lot of, you see a lot of diverse countries and nations with each with their own languages, their own laws, their own protocols, their own um, spiritualities to some degree, uh, and their own cuisines that they're sort of internationally renowned for. Um, this is very similar in that, you know, neighboring countries can be quite different and diverse the same way that, um, say, Italy is from France and France is from Spain and Germany is from um, those countries as well. So uh, me as a Gamilaroi person, neighboring countries will speak completely different languages. Um, there'll be some overlaps and some similarities, but uh, essentially we, we don't see ourselves as the same. Uh, laws and, law and governance from an indigenous perspective. So the dreaming provides a conceptual foundation uh, for appropriate ways of being with the world. The subsequent frameworks and overarching ideals which emerge from creator ancestors engagements with the landscape including conflicts and interactions yeah. with other non-human entities during the dreaming is referred to as customary law <laughs> so just an example of that um, it would typically be 
um, an interpretate a spiritual interpretation of say yeah. two uh, entities, and it could be say a dingo and an emu. Um, so in a dreaming context, uh, there'll be certain places where it will be said that that um, interaction took yeah. place between say the dingo and the emu, and it could have been yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. a point of curiosity. It could have been a fight or a conflict that they had, or it could have been something that they observed. Um, so the story of how those two entities interacted uh, in a particular place, that place will become known for that interaction and hence the story will be carried on and told over many, many generations and a, a notion of law and ceremony and ritual will be developed uh, in correspondence with the interpretation of that interaction. Um, and, <clears throat> and that's what's carried out whatever was the key learning or the key teaching from that interaction. Um, so it could be, you know, um, uh, the dingo did something that was greedy. And so a point of, um, a point of inference for that interaction and that law uh, will be then taught to say young children um, as a means of upholding yeah. and getting them, uh, building their mor moral capacity to make decisions yeah. effectively um, in consideration of greed um, as a core value that could potentially uh, be a part of that decision. Um, so that's just one example. There's hundreds of examples all across the country, um, each from those different language groups. Um, so customary law comes out of that and we learn how to behave and interact appropriately and fairly and equitably and justly um, based on what we see and what we know um, from that interaction. Um, otherwise known as first law. Uh, it embodies the feeling of a deep personal relationship with all living and non-living things. Uh, an underpinning. Why? Sorry, I just lost my place. Um, many First Nations peoples and cultures enact first law through a direct localized connection between the dreaming and creator ancestors local to their bioregion. This connection is maintained through regular participation in unique ritualized activities and ceremonies which mimic or reenact the events of the ancestors. It is through ongoing strict adherence to and collective observation of first law that indigenous governance is achieved and maintained and through which uh, 40,000 to 65,000 years of occup occupation is made possible on Australia as um, the driest habitable continent on earth. So. Um, you know, a harsh environment, uh, you are going to need something to help you through that. And first law is something that we attribute to yeah. um, the longevity of First Nations peoples in Australia. An underpinning concept which envelops First Nations interpretations of law and governance is understood as the law of relationship. <clears throat> While different First Nations communities have varied interpretations of the law, a common theme shared across groups is that the law is in the land. <clears throat> in that relationships with country, including those that are both internalized and enacted through cultural practices, processes, rituals, and ceremonies provide a yeah. fulcrum through which balance is prioritized and maintained. The dreaming therefore yeah. emanates from country via the cosmos and thus lives in, lives and is carried within each individual who absorbs it through systematized intergenerational transfer of First Nations story, which comes up through yeah. places on the land where creator ancestors are said to have been. Yeah. The law of relationship reminds people of the importance of balance and harmony. Further, it promotes the ongoing process of creation on earth as it teaches and gives us protocols and processes for dealing with difference and respecting and honoring wow. diversity. The notion wow. of balance is the basis of custodianship along with social and ecological regulation. Disturbances throughout physical and spiritual systems are perceived as the result of direct, indirect, or sustained imbalances within primordial energetic uh, realms. All humans are implicated in these shifts as it's not just an indigenous force, it is one that connects us all, uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous. Yeah. Balance, harmony, sustainability, and good health from this viewpoint are all inextricably bound and dependent on collective participation in the law of relationship. Some indigenous languages capture the interconnectedness of such ideas. For example, the Uralan people of the Northern Territory and Australia's Northwest interior suggest that a person is punyo when they are feeling fully alive. Moreover, punyo 
uh, can describe a person who is good, happy, strong, healthy, smart, responsible, beautiful, and clean. Similarly, punyo can also refer to the time when people burn off yeah. the tall grass in the correct season. Uh, and for anybody who hasn't heard of cultural burning, um, it's a practice in Australia where um, a yeah. fire will be put on the country or lit on the country at a particular type of, uh, in a particular environment yeah. in the right season and it will produce the right fire, which is usually a very small, cool burn. Um, I understand that people in various parts of Northern Europe are, are familiar with um, those types of small, cool, slow moving fires. Um, so hopefully um, there's a good reference point for that for everybody. Yeah. Um, if not, yeah. um, that's something you could easily find more uh, information on, um, Indigenous cultural burning. <clears throat> and country and identity, so the in interconnections yeah. between land, language and culture, the basis of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identity in Australia. The notion of country is an overarching concept that captures the relational complexity of all things held within a particular bioregion or context by aggregating key combinatorial elements of place. So those are the seasonal factors, the um, behavioral uh, and migratory yeah, yeah. elements of different landscapes. Um, so they all come together to create uh, yeah. a complex that what I'm suggesting is a complex adaptive system. Yeah. These elements are multidimensional and can include seasonal patterns such as temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, yeah. rainfall, grass curing, moon phases and tidal fluctu fluctuations, all along with human, sorry, non-human animal and kin related yeah. distribution behaviors and migrations. All of these serves as inf informatics within indigenous cultural contexts, which constitute a yeah. series of living complex holonic systems which are highly interdependent, yeah. self-organizing, and interconnected. Each of the yeah. systems then interact in ways which foster emergence, emergent relationally bound community and kinship dynamics to co-constitute a new system that is more than the sum of its parts. First Nations spiritual and cultural identities are greatly influenced and enhanced by the responsibilities that have been given to them by creator ancestors to care for these systems. Um, alas, our first law, what I was saying before. Okay. Individual and collective behaviors are shaped in response to real-time feedback loops in the environment where changes in ecological patterns can trigger adaptations which support the continuation of life and overall ecosystem health. Yeah. First Nations peoples have sustained these processes since creation and therefore understand the importance of co-evolutionary dynamics, local constraints, pressures, and adaptations. It is conceivable that they would over time become interwoven into the pattern of creation yeah and the webs of relationships that are ultimately expressed through country. Yeah. Country is so yeah. embedded within the fiber of First Nations identity and spirituality that there are in, excuse me, incommensurable differences between a yeah. sense of self, home, and belonging. Otherwise, the land is sometimes personified as mother or friend, or it can be spoken about in the same ways that one would talk about a close relative or family yeah. member. First Nations peoples can also develop deeply emotive connections to the land as a result of a, such ontological belonging. And First Nations posit that country is animate, living, all-inclusive, and has levels of sentience that give it an ability yeah. to know, hear, smell, observe, care, and feel. As a direct result of the dreaming and the trails and movements of creator ancestors across the landscape, song lines are said to also crisscross the continent with maps of story, carrying knowledge along the lines of energy that manifest as law in the mind and land as one. In this regard, each country and its bioregional context is imbued with layers of essence and meaning. Yeah. And just a few slides on um, the science of, of country that I've sort of been able to pull together um, for the time being, but I would love to um, delve a little bit deeper in this yeah. uh, in the future and hopefully within the context of my um, study and PhD, I'll be able to um, but the yeah. but spirituality and culture sorry spiritually and culturally significant activities such as a welcome to country along with smoking and cleansing ceremonies draw on age old protocols designed to maintain the health of social yeah. and ecological systems and to uphold the responsibilities of care required through a perpetual adherence to the laws of country and the law of yeah. relationship. Traditional owners uh, perform welcome ceremonies in many different yeah. ways. In performing a welcome to country, some groups light smoky fires yeah, with yeah. wet eucalyptus or paper bark leaves so that the smoke wraps around the visitors and makes them one with the place. 
other types of welcome ceremonies might involve uh, throwing water on visitors, um, otherwise known as a, a water ceremony, or wiping the sweat of an elder on the visitor's body or face so that the visitor smells like the traditional owner. Several plant species have been shown to have the ability to respond to stimuli and adapt to their environments in flexible, context-sensitive and risk-sensitive ways and are able to anticipate future contingencies and can perhaps even learn and remember. Plants can also respond to abiotic factors and strategically evolve and adapt their growth and development to suit conditions. Many insects on country uh, use chemical and olfactory communication mechanisms to adapt their behavior to environmental changes, including between insect and insect and insect and plant relationships, although chemical signals and changes in various insect populations are shown to both influence and be influenced by human activities, okay, interactions yeah. and interventions. Yeah. Other non-human kin, such as mammals and reptiles, are all responsive to human interactions, whether they are passive, aggressive or neutral encounters. Some mammals and marsupials rely on multisensory inputs oh, to detect okay. human presence and smell and taste are an interrelated system in most reptiles and this function is perhaps their most important sense. So the reason why I just wanted to quickly outline that is because um, usually if we're as humans, whether you're indigenous or non-indigenous um, or anything beyond or in between, um, when you go out on country, you're inherently making yourself a part of that system. Um, you're not an objective sort of node that can go in the system and not have any kind of impact yeah. on it. So when we're going out on country, uh, it's important to know that we are part of those systems and we become yeah. part of them the minute that we step foot on them. Um, but even when we go away from them, we still have some kind of influence over um, yeah. that environment, <clears throat> uh, whether that's distant okay. or, um, or in close proximity to it. Um, and so an indigenous protocol when we're going out on country is to call out on country. So usually that will be done in indigenous language and it's to, um, to speak to the country and let it know that you're coming on there and what your intentions are. Um, so, um, and that's been maintained since before colonization and it's something that indigenous people will still quite often do today is speak to the country and um, relate to it in ways that are both verbal but also energetic and perhaps spiritual as well. And I just want to flag as well, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not delving into the area of plant sentience. I know that's a bit of a contested um, domain and it's something that requires a lot more research. But um, in terms of plant responsivity or uh, responsiveness of country, um, it is something that Indigenous people are aware of, um, yeah. but more work ne needs to be done um, in that domain between Indigenous knowledge and Western yeah. science to um, come up with an effective yeah. um, and... Uh, and accurate idea of what um, how country responds to people being there. And just quickly, um, medicinal smoke and pyrolyzed and non-pyrolyzed essential oils from Australian native plants, such as Eremophila longifolia, or what we, yeah. some of us uh, call emu bush, has been identified as an effective medium for containing diverse pathogenic bacteria, enhancing therapeutic activity yeah. and significantly increasing antimicrobial activity. So things like smoking ceremonies in indigenous Australian contexts, um, they have been shown to um, have very effective medicinal properties yeah. in the context of reducing uh, and increase, sorry, reducing pathogens and also increasing uh, antimicrobial activity. Wow. And in contemporary Australia, yeah. smoking rituals have now become a part of everyday life from the opening of parliament to a range of ceremonial activities that are, through, that are thought to be distinctively Australian. Yeah. The emergence of scientific explorations into several Australian native plant species utilised for smoking rituals verify the anecdotal references by Indigenous Australians as medically and biochemically significant for promoting radical scavenging capacity. Other smoke-based rituals and ceremonies can carry across to diverse okay. ceremonial contexts uh, as well, such as burial and funerary activities. Similar convergences have been found in an analyses of certain medicinal plants which had previously been yeah. said to have psychoactive properties. Similar to other global cultures, these plants were used to support funerary rites and aiding spirits to return to their yeah. homes. And just in conclusion, yeah. uh, recent research has demonstrated that some elements of what is considered First Nations Australian spirituality does in fact have uh, scientific legitimacy, while it's not necessary for Indigenous spiritualities to have scientifically verifiable elements or constituents to be valid. It's important that consideration is given for the interactivities between complex domains 
within First Nations peoples, histories, languages, yeah. and cultures. Um, this, there's still so much that we as a global human collective yeah. can learn from First Nations spiritualities. We can explore the depths of these teachings and learn to appreciate them by reconnecting them with the land in many, sorry, by reconnecting yeah. with the land in meaningful ways, that is us, uh, under the yeah. guidance of First Nations elders and First Nations peoples. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, really looking forward to uh, questions and discussion and, and learning more from you. And, and now we'll just go straight to Christina uh, because our time is limited. And I'll just quickly introduce Christina and then we'll be able to have uh, more of a discussion and um, some questions to Josh after that. So Christina, Rosh Rosha, I'm sorry, can you correct me? Because I know you so well that's right. and then I have that's a feeling right. <laughs> that I have just done it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. I was correct. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Religion and Society Research Cluster at Western Sydney University. She co-edits the Journal of Global Buddhism and the Religion in the Americas Brill series. Her research focuses on the intersections of globalization, religion, and immobilities. She is the author of the award-winning book, John of God, The Globalization of Brazilian Faith Healing, and of the recent exciting new book on cool Christianity. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. I'm going to share so my slide. Yeah. Um, the bottom shouldn't be the bottom. Okay. Is that um okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, yes. Great. Thank you. Good. Good. So, um, thank you so much. Um. Raphael and also Mar, who's not here today, but for the invitation is really exciting to be part of this network um, and present here. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk today is um, based on a paper that Alexandra Rodzinski from at the time Deakin University and myself, we worked together on the links between biomedicine, um, complementary and alternative medicine, that is CAM and spirituality in Australia. And we wanted to discuss why so many people who were, um, who saw themselves as spiritual were denying the value of biomedicine at the start of the COVID pandemic. And I think a lot of people were asking themselves that same question. So practitioners of alternative and medicine and spirituality often, often highlight the narratives of healing as evidence of the superiority of their modalities over biomedicine. That's one of the things we found. And in this paper, we argued that the bodily evidence embedded in personal stories of transformation serves as a compelling weapon in truth contests against biomedicine. We argued, um, so Alex is a historian and I'm an anthropologist. So in our conversations, we realized that this form of establishing and defending truth through the body, bodily narratives has a long history. So we then based our analysis in two different periods, one in the late 19th century, when alternative theories about relationships between the mind, the body and the spirit flourished against a backdrop of political and religious transformation. And the other period was the late, uh, was late modernity and contemporary times when increased self-reflexivity and mistrust of secular institutions such as biomedicine have prompted growth in alternative medical systems. And this was compounded by crises such as the climate crisis, but also the COVID pandemic. We, in this paper, outlined how recurring narratives of the healed body position the individual in, as in control of their physical and spiritual uh, healing. By analyzing contemporary narratives of the healed body as an archive of truth, 
we endeavored to deepen our understanding of why denialist beliefs about vaccination and COVID-19 can prove to be so intractable. So what I'm going to do here is to focus on the contemporary contest, um, context uh, and because that was the, my part of the paper and I think it can be very relevant to what we are discussing today. So today, I'm going to define these three concepts, biomedicine, CAM, and spirituality very quickly. Then I'm going to explain this research on transnational faith healing uh, with the Brazilian healer who has, has become a global phenomenon, attracting people from all over the world to his spiritual hospital in central Brazil. Then I'm going to give a short narrative of, of the man who saw his healed body as an archive of truth, right? And... I will explain why those, I those whom I interviewed chose alternative medicine and spirituality over biomedicine and the implications uh, this has to today's world um, and denialist um, convictions. So Western medicine um, achieved primacy for healing in Australia and other parts of the world in the 20th century. But this dom dominative position long entailed a contest for other healing practices and perspectives. And this negotiation continues to this day. So biomedicine or Western medicine is often defined by the classic Cartesian separation between the spirit and meta, mind and body, real and unreal, um, and visible and invisible, right? And it employs a mechanistic metaphor of the body. Disease is due to a broken part of the body that needs to be fixed. So biomedicine draws on a radical separation, uh, stating that illness is in the, either in the mind or in the body. And there are two disciplines to focus on that. So you have psychology or psych. Uh, psychiatry um, that will focus on the mind and the other um, modalities that focus, the other disciplines that focus on the body. Of course, we have the concept of psychosomatic disease attempting to bridge this gap, but still it reflects a division, the psycho and the somatic. So I'll move to CAM now, it's complementary and alternative medicine. And these are health practices that fall outside conventional medicine. They are holistic in that they don't separate between mind and body, visible and visible, and the, the individual and the environment. Now, we call them complementary because biomedical doctors and hospitals have adopted them to, due to a high demand from the public. So they are complementary to biomedicine. And so in a way, biomedicine is still the center, is still perceived as superior to alternative medicine. And finally, I use the concept uh, of spirituality by Brian Turner, who defined it as an emotional, personal, and post-institutional form of religiosity. But I would add that it's not only personal, but communal. And that's what I found in my book on this healer, John of God. So healing becomes here um, a journey, um, a, a process of self-transformation. So for over a decade, I researched Western followers of the Brazilian faith healer, John of God, whose spiritual hospital, and it's interesting how he uses this these words, it's not a healing center, but it's a spiritual hospital. He bridges this gap between biomedicine and spirit and alternative medicine. Um, and his spiritual hospital is in central Brazil. And he uses meditation, as you can see here, a picture of people in the spiritual hospital meditating, but he also used crystals for healing. But what um made him really famous globally is that he um, also uses, um, uses surgery. He uh, operates on people. And I'm going to show you some slides of these operations. So please be aware that you can close your eyes if you don't like to see people being cut. But what he does is that he operates on people with a kitchen knife without a sepsis or anesthetics. And here he is uh, scraping somebody's eye 
and here he is um, stitching somebody's um, chest uh, without a sepsis or anesthetics. And these are internet, these are uh, people from foreigners, not Brazilians. These guys from New Zealand, the other one was Russian uh, in his uh, spiritual hospital. So by doing this, he has become a global phenomenon um, in the first two decades of this century. And international followers have written books on him. Um, also, there have there are international tour guides taking people from their own countries to Brazil. Um, so you can see here from this slide that's the website of a tour guide, and he and this tour guide is uh, adding John of God to other trip trips that the tour guide takes. Uh, called shamanic journeys. So that's really interesting. Um, this is also John of God travels um, and conducts international healing events annually in the US, but also in Germany, New Zealand, and in Australia, he, where he came in 2014. And he became so famous at a point in 2002 and at 12, sorry, the Queen of American TV, Oprah Winfrey, went and visited him and interviewed him for her program. Here he is with Win, uh, Oprah and a translator. And even performance artist Marina Abramovich went to Brazil and made a film uh, with him. Um, so this research res uh, resulted in the publication of the book that Anna kindly mentioned, John of God, the Globalization of Brazilian Faith Healing in 2017. But by 2019, he was jailed for sexual and spiritual abuse. And we can talk a bit more about this later on, but that's not the focus of this paper. Um, so, um, and then, you know, I had to think about what this me meant for the people who, the foreigners who, um, we're going to John of God and his international standing. But my questions with this book were, why would people seek a faith healer in the global South when they had the access to the best medicine in their own countries, biomedicine in their own countries? And why would they desire to be operated on without a sepsis or anesthetics uh, by somebody whom they can't communicate with, right? John of God doesn't speak any other languages but Portuguese, so people translated for him all the time. Um, so my focus was on the followers' experiences of transformation rather than the usual focus on the healer's practices. So in this, I followed um, anthropologist Thomas Shorders, who uh, argued that at this stage in the um, development of a theory of healing. Um, I have to, I have to, okay. In this stage in the development of a theory of healing is a specification of how therapeutic processes of effects transformation in existential states, an approach grounded in participants own experience and perceptions of change may arrive at a more pragmatic conceptualization of healing as a cultural process. So that my, my focus was healing as a cultural process, as an anthropologist, of course. So to do that, I wanted to tell you um, a little short narrative uh, from one of the many, drawing on one of the many people I interviewed there and I did field work with. Um, and the, for this man, who's an Australian man in his 50s, healing for him was not only about the elimination of illness, but about the transformation of the self. So Mark, as I said, is an Australian. He was 50 years old when I interviewed him. And he was in his early 20s um, when doctors suspected that he had Hodgkin's disease. He went through many tests and Mark says that he was not told of the test results and felt that doctors used him as a guinea pig. After that, they put him on a treatment of radiotherapy uh, from his chin to his hips, he told me, for one and a half months. And he identified this treatment as the beginning of his health problems. Later on, when he developed heart murmurs, another doctor told him that two of his heart valves, his thyroid and salivary glands were damaged to, 
due to excessive exposure to radiation. The doctor went on to tell him he would have to have valve replacement surgery in his 50s. So Mark says that he was annoyed and went away disgusted. As time passed, he says that other organs started failing as the result of radiotherapy. In 1998, he says he contracted a cold which made him cough blood. The same cardiologist who predicted he would have surgery in his 50s told him that now was the time to undergo surgery. He says that, and I quote, I just wanted to go run away from the hospital and just get away. So in the following days, he went to visit his parents and they were watching a program on six, uh, the 60 Minutes program. And coincidentally, the program was on John of God. And so what he did was he immediately called an Australian guide um, to go to see John of God in Brazil. And he left uh, for John of God's spiritual hospital in the next few days. He says he was hoping that John of God would give him um, a visible, that is a, a visible operation, a cut, uh, uh, an operation with cut. He explains his willingness to be cut by someone he had barely met without anesthetics or asepsis by saying, I had a gut feel that if he gave me um, a physical, that is a visible operation with cut, he would probably accelerate whatever effect would be there. It just would have been good for me, just spiritually and mentally and psychologically and all the rest. By contrast, he says of Western medicine, I don't want any, uh, to have, I'm sorry, I don't have any faith in the system anymore. And even if the system works, unfortunately, along the way, you find incompetence and I don't want to get across, to come across any incompetence. As it turned out, John of God only gave him an invisible operation, which is another way of doing, of having the operation is just praying and putting your heart, or your hand on your heart for 10 minutes. And that's about that. He returned to Australia feeling a bit better, but still not well. With time, he became so sick that he finally agreed to be operated on by his cardiologist. After the operation, he continued to return to John, John of God's Healing Center and go to international healing events. Four years later, when another heart valve had to be replaced, Mark decided to go to Brazil again. This time, things were different. He says that while John of God was scraping someone's eye, John of God looked at Mark. He recounts, the second time he looked at me, that was it. My legs started weakening. My chest started tightening. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't stand. I couldn't maintain consciousness. I was battling to stand and I felt like I felt like collapsing and I thought there was something wrong with me. I didn't realize what was going on. A staff worker told me, you'd better come to the recovery room. You have just had a very big operation. He says that he never lost faith in John of God because it's not a simple case of you've got a problem. You go there. He either fixes, fixes you or he doesn't. If there is healing to be done, it will be done. The process is different for every individual. And I figured, well, I don't like the idea of suffering, but if suffering is what I have to go through, then so be it. That's the way I can explain it. I guess it was, you know, part of my package. I had to go through suffering. There's karmic debt to be repaid. Repaid. Looking back at all he went through, Mark concludes that now he feels much more himself physically, emotionally, and spiritually. He ended up the interview by saying, and I quote, everybody needs healing and healing is not a one-off. It's a process. It's part of growth. It's part of development. Along the way, healing is part of the package people uh, need to go through. So what can we learn from this narrative? The first one, of course, is a disillusionment with biomedicine's ability to heal illness, um, to, deal, to deal with illness, particularly chronic illness. Mark and many others I interviewed felt that they had been victims of medical errors and doctors refused to concede that they had made mistakes. 
but also situations where Western medicine offered no cure, such as chronic illnesses, drove people to seek alternative healing systems or miracles. Here we can see a belief that Western medicine only attends to the physical body, while the illness's origin may be emotional, mental, or spiritual. For people involved in energy healing or spiritual healing, there is more than one um, body um, which is important here. It's the physical, it's the mental, it's the spiritual and the emotional bodies. So when Mark says that now he feels um, more himself physically, emotionally and spiritually, he's acknowledging that these other bodies have entered the equation for his healing too. The other thing we can learn is there is a search for a more egalitarian relationship between doctors and patients, that is an empowerment of patients. Many felt that they were treated poorly, that doctors didn't have time for them, which is of course a function of our diminishing public funding for health in the world. Um, they were not listening to, they, their stories were not relevant for the diagnosis. And I think this is key here, their stories were not relevant when they have these narratives of, of the body, of what they are feeling. And that's how they um, assert the truth of, of what is important to them and what works. The next thing is there is a search for meaning in the context of their illness. So in biomedicine, disease has no other meaning than bad luck, right? Or there's a cause for this and the cause is biological as well. But alternative medicine and spirituality give meaning to illness. They explain this, that sometimes um, this overwhelming and frightening experience of pain and threat of death, uh, and they explain, explain this in spiritual and environmental terms. So illness is reinterpreted as a time to take stock. To be, it becomes a journey, a process one has to go through in order to grow spiritually. Healing is perceived as a continuous and progressive um, process of inner change. So healing is not only about the elimination of a thing or illness or a problem or a symptom, but about the transformation of the self. Mark sees his illness as a package he, had, he was given and which he cannot escape. But this package is necessary for him to progress, to grow into something better. Next is empowerment through surrendering to a higher power. And this is a bit paradoxical, isn't it? So like Mark, all the people I interviewed felt empowered, empowered once they left the medical system behind and sought other forms of healing. They felt they were in charge of their illness by being able to choose more holistic modalities of healing. So in this paper, I inquired into why Westerners were attracted to John of God's healing practices and spirituality to the point of being willing to undergo surgery with no asepsis or anesthetics. I showed that, this, that his appeal lies in several factors. Spirituality gives meaning to illness by considering it to be a journey of personal spiritual growth. In this sense, healing involves the transformation of the self into something better. It establishes a close connection between religion and healing, something that has been discarded by Western medicine. And my interviewees told me that precisely this connection was an important factor in their adherence to faith healing. So during social crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the competition between systems becomes more visible and consequential. The same motivations that drive some to seek alternative healing propel them to resist government action that curb COVID-19, such as vaccines and masks. Not all who engage in spiritual healing, of course, are against government policies. But better understanding of the motivations of those who are vaccine hesitant and more strongly anti-vaccination and the kinds of evidence that they marshal will assist in influencing their thinking. Significant reasons for, the, for vaccine hesitancy are similar to those that people give to using alternative medicine, as we saw. For example, the body injured by medical errors, the feeling of not being heard 
by doctors, the power of pharmaceutical companies and their close dealings with government. The contemporary crisis of knowledges, therefore, constitutes a contest between forms of evidence, that of data and numbers, versus the personal, the experiential, the experiential and the metaphysical. As researchers attempt to understand how anti-biomedicine positions become entrenched among followers of alternative health knowledges, we argue that the evidence of truth lodged in the bodies of believers serves as a transformative and compelling force of resistance. And I finish here. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Okay, so I think given the time difference, we don't have uh, audience members in this webinar. It is the four of us. So um, I think questions we can ask one another and um, we have a little bit of time to do that. So I don't know, Raphael, do you have any burning questions you might like to ask Josh and Christina before I do? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentations. I was really like taking notes all the time. And for me, uh, the case of, um, of Christina, it rings more of a bell, uh, me being Brazilian and having heard about it somehow, but I, I never knew much more in, in such depth. But um, in Australia, I, I've been fascinated since I visited last year in a conference in and Joshua gave me a very interesting uh, layout. Um, I was very curious when uh, you were talking about Josh, the, 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 when you showed the map and you showed the different, the diversity of cultures, I was wondering about um, uh, the forms of differentiation between these different uh, cultures, having so many cultures and the crossover in between. So, um, people from different languages uh, gathering or not and how this would work. And I thought about this because I also thought about something else, which is I was fascinated by the notion of the dreaming, which is the, the translation, right? The, the, the dreaming, uh, the idea of the dreaming, the connection with the ancestors and temporality and, and et cetera and all that. And I, for me, I just wanted to know a, a bit more about it if this is something that you, it's something that everyone can go through this experience, it is something in it, or how it's, uh, it's transmitted, um, a bit on a bit more uh, uh, on these aspects. And I don't know if I ask uh, Christina now or later or. Shall... Uh, maybe let's just have um Josh respond and then you can Perfect. ask Christina. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much for the, the question, um, Raphael. Yeah. Um, in terms of like looking at bigger gatherings, so uh, there were definitely um, scheduled, periodic, um, almost systematic um, timings for gatherings. So uh, I'm very fortunate to live in an area where one of the biggest gatherings in Australia took place uh, um, just about 90 minutes away from the Bunya Mountains, um, or what is sometimes referred to as Bunya Buru. Um, <clears throat> and I work very closely with a traditional owner from okay. that area, yeah. uh, Dr. John okay. Davis, who's a Burungam, um Waka Waka and Cobble Cobble man. Um, and I've sort of been around um, other knowledge holders who sort of hold story for that place. Um, Bunya Buru basically translates to um, bunya nuts, so there's these, these giant bunya nuts, yeah. they're about the size of a bowling ball. Um, we often say don't park your car underneath one at the at uh, that time of year when they're in full fruit because yeah. your, your car might be might receive a bit of damage from it because um, they fall from about 30, yeah. 30 meters um, or about 90 feet. Um, so they're quite yeah. um, they're quite prominent in this area. They have been known as a very um, important source of food. And sustenance for people yeah. from around the east coast and people would travel from you know hundreds of kilometers to uh to come and be at yeah. the bunya mountains for these big festivals and people say that there were up to about two thousand people there and ac 
across all yeah. different language yeah. groups and different yeah. um, places, obviously they would have to find ways yeah. to communicate. So generally it was said that there was basically a lingua franca, so a shared common language yeah. that people would speak and, um, and use to communicate with each other. Um, but also there were um, people who spoke okay. up to 15 different languages. So there were people who could sort of translate yeah, and interpret. Sure. Um, across the different language groups um, if there were communication barriers. So, um, yeah, those those things can kind of help out with communicating across um, the different cultures. Yeah. Um, but typically, there wasn't much room yeah. for things like conflict because of the differing belief systems. Okay. Um, you know, I think that what I've been able to gauge is that, you know, it's, it's really important to have a lot of different interpretations of the same thing yeah. because you end up knowing more about that thing by um, <clears throat> undergoing processes where you learn um, about different perspectives. So say, for example, if I talk about um, our rainbow serpent, so a lot of people are familiar with the rainbow serpent, um, the story that I have might describe, um, you know, the, the pattern of um, scales on his belly, uh, whereas, you know, the, the language so the story of that same entity from another language group's perspective, they might describe, um, you know, his footprint or, uh, yeah. and then another language group might describe in their story, his smell. And then another group in yeah. there, like you say in final Queensland, they might describe yeah. um, the way that light um, reflects off his eyes um, from a campfire at night. Um, so when we, when everybody comes together and you share all those different stories that yeah. each uh, language group and community holds, you end up putting together this big puzzle, um, which gives you a bigger idea and a more um, accurate depiction of the same entity yeah. that you're all talking about, but you only hold one piece of that puzzle. Um, so those, uh, yeah. those are really important considerations if we're talking yeah. about um, getting to know, say, uh, <clears throat> um, the purpose of humanity yeah. or uh, uh, a god, yeah. say, for example. Okay. Um, it's because we all hold one piece of that puzzle that we can all connect better and relate to um, that entity or country or creation. Um, so there's no room there to, you know, go out and, and have a fight because I call it this and someone else calls it that. Or someone says um, it looks this way and I say it looks that way because if I destroy or get that person to absorb or assimilate into a different cultural value, then we lose that information. So it's really important to harbour that diversity and that's written into the context of the law of relationship that I spoke about before. Yeah. And I think, yeah, to answer your other question, like I think it, that's open for everybody. Everybody has access to some kind of notion of dreaming. Um, yeah. Yeah. What it takes, I think, is just really deep connection into your place and, yeah. um, you know, spending a lot of time um, considering and reflecting yeah. and yeah. perhaps yeah. <clears throat> um, passing on that knowledge yeah. intergenerationally. <laughs> Just coming into deeper connection and relationship with um, yeah. those places um, through ritualistic and ceremonial contexts, but I don't have an answer for that one. But that's uh, I think what are some of the important considerations. Thank you so much, Josh and Raphael, for your questions. So, do you want to you you ask your question to Christina, and then I have one question for both speakers and that might be all we have time for today but yes so next Perfect. um so um the the, the fact that uh, many patients i don't know the ratio but the, many patients were were foreigners right were from uh, other countries um were they following also other spiritual or religious traditions uh is something that you, that you can know about it like were they already coming with a previous belief system or were they spirit the, the, the bodily change uh, happened alongside a spiritual change like how how this this process happened uh, for them if they were religious or not thank you uh rafael um so um I was researching the foreigners and there were lots of Brazilians there. I would say that at one point there were more foreigners than Brazilians and then the Brazilians caught up with the foreigners coming and then he, they, he became very famous in Brazil. So he was more famous overseas first 
Uh, and then that's how it happens with um, peripheral and semi-peripheral countries, even in Australia too. You have to be famous in the UK or in Hollywood to become famous in Australia. It's the same thing. So John of God was became really famous overseas and then all these Brazilians start coming. But he, you know, um, there were all kinds of people there. Uh, the, there. So there were people who um, were very much into alternative medicine from the start and they were followers, for example, of um, Sai Baba, Ama, and all the healers and, and gurus. And so John of, I saw John of God getting into the circuit of, of these gurus and followers, uh, not only of alternative medicine, but of spirituality. So people would, or Ram Das, people would go to Sai Baba and then go to John of God and then go to America, to another, to California to see another person and do a workshop and all this. And there were people who were just desperate. They had been uh, told by medical doctors that there was they were terminal, that there was nothing they can do about it and they would come. And there were people who had uh, were sick and just refused to even go to the first doctor to be you know diagnosed and went straight to John of God. Um, so there were people who were immersed in alternative spirituality and there were people who were not um but they learned a lot of the beliefs and and uh practices there as well with their tour guides uh, so i have a chapter in the book about with the work of tour guides as cultural translators so the tour guides would teach them um to understand to um, to make sense of what the, of their extraordinary experiences there, uh, and that was very interesting. And in how they, you know, so it, John of God is very Catholic. Besides a million other things, he, you know, he's from Umbanda as well. He was a Babalorisha, like a head priest of Umbanda, which is an African Brazilian religion of of um, trans, but totally Catholic, right? Very Brazilian, and he would. So there were prayers, the, um, um, the our father, you know, um, the, the prayers, the Lord's Prayer and um, the Hail Mary at the beginning of every session in the morning. And then the tour guides would go, oh, my God, you know, this is so Catholic. We can't. So our people that we're bringing are not into this. So they would say, look, what you have to do is to think as the male principle and the female principle, because John of God, you know, Brazil is very Catholic. So, but, you know, just abstract that, think of, or just if you are not into that, just breathe while they are praying. So they would translate culturally to these people, but also teach them about spiritism. That's one of the things that John of God said that he was following was spiritism. So there was a little bookshop there and they would sell spiritist books, uh, Alain Kardec, and, you know, all translated into English and many other languages. So that was really interesting as well. Um, so some had previous beliefs um, in, in alternative medicine. Some didn't have that, but they were all very interested in, under, uh, in understanding what was going on there because that was so beyond anything that people would have, you know, experienced. Um, so that was, and then they had to learn and they would learn from each other in the cafes and sit for hours in the cafes and chat in the posadas, the guest houses for lunch, we would sit together or end through um, their tour guides. Stop here. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Um, with, I just hope it's not uh, too complicated. <laughs> so I'm trying to link them all together. So Christina spoke of the diminutive position of Western medicine and science in modernity and these false Cartesian binaries of spirit matter, uh, the sacred profane, and this, um, in my words, a more sort of compartmentalized rather than a holistic approach within Western medical systems. And then, Josh, you ended your presentation really stressing this um, this fact that science is now 
so our current contemporary science is now verifying um, the, the health, well-being and environmental benefits um, of Indigenous practices such as smoking ceremony uh, and cultural burning. And so what this triggered in me was, um, so we've in research that we've been doing also on this nexus of science and spirituality, and I know other uh, eminent scholars in Europe have have come to quite similar conclusions that that science and spirituality do not necessarily have to be seen as you know opposites or always in tension with one another and indeed in our uh, preliminary research on science and spirituality in Australia um, we found that so-called spiritual people, whether they were spiritual but not religious or even spiritual and religious, and some of our respondents also were Indigenous spiritual, um, that actually they had quite a high level of faith in science, but it was a certain type of science. It was science that was doing exactly what you mentioned, Josh, and what you're talking about, Christina. It was science that was demonstrating the benefits of Indigenous and non-Western forms of uh, medicine or yeah cultural practices towards environmental um, sustainability given uh, the the terrible situation that the earth and our bodies are in now so my question with all that background is yeah why do you think there is this intensification there seems to be of interest uh, in this nexus between science and spirituality right now um, from your um, various uh, and different positionality. So maybe, Josh, if you want to go first and then Christina. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Really great question. Yeah. Uh, in From an Indigenous community context, so there's always been, well, for the last probably almost 100 years, um, there's always there's been a, um, a really point, a really strong point of contention between science and Indigenous knowledge, and that's partly because science, or pseudoscience more specifically, has been used to justify um, really poor yeah. behaviour towards Indigenous yeah. people. And, you know, people from everywhere, minority groups um, all across the globe have been subject to pseudoscientific approaches which have set out to create a specific outcome rather than, um, rather than facilitating an equitable process of knowledge generation and transmission and production. <clears throat> um, so the, I think we're still in a bit of a tricky space uh, as Indigenous communities where we're accepting and embracing what science can do, um, given that it has created so much harm in the past. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot more people are starting to find um, that it can be helpful and it can be productive. And that's partly coming through um, land-based approaches which come through ranger programs so ranger programs specifically that are designed to look after the country and put fire on the country a lot of those groups are kind of just in spaces where incidentally they're working together uh, with western scientists to look at um, species preservation habitat um, and biodiversity monitoring and uh, environmental improvement um, across the country so I think a lot of people are looking at that as an example and saying, oh, it can be done that, you know, Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge systems can come together with science, uh, Western science uh, approaches to create something that we didn't, none of us knew before. Um, you know, we knew this and they knew that or um, different groups possess different um, ideas and bases of knowledge around those things. But then we both found out something that we didn't know before by working together. Um, so I think there's there's productivity in that and people are starting to see that it can be done. Um, but I think there's still a little ways to go um, to continue to embrace that. Uh, part of the work that I do is in the space of complexity. So um, looking at, you know, moving away from some of those dualities and saying, oh, it's not just about this or that, or it's not just about the binary um, or polarized perspectives that, you know, we don't talk to each other, we don't work together. Um, but coming in together and saying, oh, you know, there's some complexity here. There's a lot of things that we need to consider. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a constellation of possibilities um, that are that are sitting there um, if you pay attention to them. So um, something that I find really, uh, really interesting is, yeah, this process where complexity is coming into things like sociology and things like um, system science and 
you know, creating more opportunities and more possibilities that um, have greater capacity to bring people together, um, but also to create new opportunities that are based in um, not reductionist um, ideas or perspectives, but, you know, opportunity, uh, equity, justice and, and, um, and possibility. Thank you so much, Josh. And Christina? Hi, uh, yeah, with the people that I've been talking to, it's it's always this, this feeling of crisis, right? We live in a time of crisis, and that's what Alex, uh, Alex as well, looking at the 19th century, was a period of crisis and transition. Um, so as a, in a period of crisis, a lot of people, you know, we're talking about how they were detached from this industrialized world that didn't bring us um, much good, that, you know, the destruction on the environment, the precarity, the stress that they were through, um, they were undergoing. The, the So there was a health crisis, uh, an environmental crisis, um, an economic crisis on all sorts of crises, and there was a lot of nostalgia for a pre-industrial world, right? A world before all this started, the pollution, the you know, the industry, the, the factories that started help happening. So it's it's mythical, you know, this pre-industrial world, of course, because you know, there was a lot of exploitation before that, even if people worked the land and, and all this or uh, and another and a lot of inequality as well. But that's where what they are looking for in the global south or seeking indigenous knowledges, I find. Um, this this pre-industrial world. Um, and I think alternative spiritualities and alternative medicine gives them a land um, a leg to stand on. Uh, when faced um, faced with you know science and other so I think that the two are seen now as complementing each other so if we can move science to have a more uh, emotional engagement with people and engagement with the environment and our planet so I think people are feeling that we are um, getting to a better synthesis as Josh was saying is complexity and not only a pragmatic approach. I think it's it's um, important. Thank you. So I think yeah. we're going to wrap wrap up here. And I think as Josh was flagging, um, there's a lot we can learn from complexity thinking within Indigenous knowledges and also the nexus within our own discipline of sociology of religion. Given that complexity theory is um, really the buzzword. Thank you to Inga Furseth, of course, for initiating that. And we're all riffing off that term since. Um, and maybe also it's fitting to put in a plug to our colleague, uh, Tyson Yankaporta, who's a CI uh, on the project. He has a wonderful book called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. Uh, so encourage everyone to read that and look up that. And there's some, if you Google Tyson's name, there are some talks that he's given and also talks within our Swell Spirituality and Wellbeing Research Network. Uh, so that's um, plugging the network too. So yeah, really delighted to be partnering with you, uh, Raphael and Mar on a number of really exciting activities in this space that are centering Indigenous knowledges and also knowledges from uh, Latin America, as well as Australia, South of the West, <laughs> as well as the Global North. I love what you said, Josh, about the diversity of knowledges around the rainbow serpent. And I think the way that we approach uh, better understanding religion and science and health definitely benefits from this uh, global perspective. Uh, so thank you for including us all here today, Raphael. Thank you again, Anna, Christina and Joshua. I think I couldn't have had a better final chapter for uh, this webinar series. Uh, I would like also to invite everyone uh, watching this chapter uh, to um, look at our YouTube channel and look at the previous five chapters. We've been four different continents, six countries uh, with 
range, ranging from African healing and science uh, to First Nations and science and, and, and health. And it's been really an interesting journey. Um, and well, hope to see you in uh, another opportunity. And also um, invite everyone also to follow the updates from our sister network, the Spirituality and Wellbeing Network, Research Network, coordinated by Anna. Um, and see you soon, hopefully. Thank you.